All right, uh, you know, last Thursday night, the uh, Fox Network moderated the debate for the top 10 Republican candidates for the presidency of the United States of America. Uh, you know, the, there are many reasons, you know, for the debates. You know, we're just, just entering into the, the political season, so there'll be several along the way. There's many reasons for them. But in general, the purpose of the debate is to help identify the person who best represents the party. All of the candidates, to one degree or another, you know, over time, are going to be criticized for their words or behaviors because they're not reflecting the values or the position of the party. Of course, there'll be party conventions, and those will culminate in the selection of a person who will receive the full endorsement of the party. They'll wear the party brand. And everything they say or do will reflect on the party and everyone associated with the party. You know, product manufacturers and service providers have long used celebrities to endorse their products. They select celebrities who have a fan base. There's a, a, a following, folks that admire them, that look up to them, want to be like them. They like their style. They like their looks. Companies are counting on the fact that those folks that look up to those celebrities will choose their products, choose their services because of those celebrity endorsements. Now, I know most of the time we, or many times, we, we select a product just because of the utility of it. It's not because of the brand. We're looking for price, maybe. But when we purposefully select a particular brand, we are showing that we identify with or that we endorse what that brand stands for. It may be designer clothing, designer handbags or shoes. It may be a type of car, maybe even a brand of food. When we purposely, purposefully select a brand, we are at least in part buying into what that brand stands for. And we associate those celebrity endorsements with the values of that brand. So, when celebrities act badly, companies or political parties, they'll try to distance themselves, at least from that bad behavior. And when celebrities or candidates behave badly enough, they even cancel their agreements, their sponsorships, because they don't want their brand associated anymore with that celebrity, what they've said, what they've done. They don't want it associated with that bad behavior. It seems especially true with, with po when politicians behave badly. The opposition party goes to great lengths to tie whatever they said or whatever they did. That characterizes the entire party. So, you know, a Democratic politician is promiscuous. The Democratic party is immoral. A Republican Politician is found to be a member of an exclusive organization. The Republican Party is bigoted. When folks accept sponsorship of a product brand, a political party, or an organization, they take on the responsibility to represent the values, the goals of that party or that brand. They become ambassadors for that brand. God invites us. He calls us to an understanding of his truth, to his values, his goals, his style of living. And in that way, God offers us sponsorship to endorse the kingdom of God and all that that entails. When we respond to that calling, and become a member of his church, we take on the responsibility for representing his brand. And just like any other representative or ambassador, our words, our behaviors, good or bad, will be associated with his brand.
In this world, products and organizations endorsed by bad behaving celebrities or politicians are boycotted. Maybe a boycott. For the church of God, our bad behavior can result in the name of God, the doctrine of God, the word of God, and the way of truth being blasphemed. Being blasphemed. My purpose this afternoon is to review a few sections of scripture that speak to the various behaviors, various attitudes that result in blasphemy. Result in God's brand being spoken evil of. And also what techniques we can use to limit that from happening. Let's start with just a definition of what is blasphemy. Not a word that we typically use in our language today. You know, there's a few, there's a few Greek words that are translated in the various forms of blasphemy in the New Testament. And, I've, and, they're, very, and they're very closely related to one another. So this is my combined definition of those few words. So blasphemy. Scolding in harsh, disrespectful, or abusive language to despise or verbally abuse with humiliating language. We look at the different definitions of the words used for blasphemy. Scolding in a harsh, disrespectful, or abusive language to despise, to verbally abuse with humiliating language. I'll just give a couple of examples, just general examples of blasphemy in the Bible. It, this is not an all-encompassing study of blasphemy and all the different uh, facets of it. So um, it's a good study, but this is only this is limited to just a few examples. So examples, uh, general uh, blasphemy, uh, tearing someone down by ridicule, just tearing somebody down by ridicule. Oh, you think you're special? You think that you're you know you're all that? You're you think you're chosen people? You think you're special in that way. Just look at the state you were in. You're nothing. So make reference to Matthew 22, verse 39. You don't have to turn there. You can turn there later. Matthew 22, 39, and also Luke 22, 65. Luke 22, 65. Those are examples where the people blasphemed Jesus the Christ. And they said to him, and they said of him, in abusive, humiliating language, you are not who you claim to be. They blasphemed. You are not who you claim to be. It's an example of blasphemy in the Bible. Another example is making false accusations and exaggerating a person's words and behavior in an attempt to humiliate. Make reference later to Romans chapter 3, verse 8. Romans chapter 3, verse 8. Paul talks about how uh, on a few where his words, his teaching, his behaviors were exaggerated and misrepresented. He was claimed to say something that he did not say. They blasphemed him. They blew out of proportion. They exaggerated. They took something that was said and just took it beyond. We never see examples of that in this world, do we? All it takes is the government to say, we're going to do X, and buddy, it is extrapolated out. I mean, the whole country's falling apart. They're going to take all our property. They're going to, you know, whatever. Whatever freedoms are, are going to be taken away by whatever is, seems to be proposed. So it is a form of blasphemy to take something that somebody has said or something that they have done and just blow it out of proportion and exaggerate it for the purpose of tearing them down, of of ridiculing them or humiliating them. That's a form of blasphemy. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. All right, so now I'd like to look at uh, various sections of Scripture, kind of glean from them what behaviors can lead to blasphemy and what behaviors can protect against blasphemy. I'm going to say protect against blasphemy because the reality is, I'm not going to get deep into this aspect, but just the way of life that we live is going to cause some people to blaspheme God. That's just going to occur. We can't prevent that. 
but we can prevent legitimate complaints and arguments about our words and behaviors. If they blaspheme God because of the truth, that's a separate issue. And I'm not going to get into that aspect of blasphemy. So Romans chapter 2. Uh, verse 1 through 3. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is, in court, is according to truth against those who practice such things. Do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now let's look at, uh, just skip down to verse 21. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Do you say do not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through blaspheme? For by breaking the law, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is a quote from the Old Testament, a couple different references where the Gentile nations blasphemed the God of Israel because of the behavior of Israel. Now, in this case, Paul was addressing Jewish religious leaders and, and teachers who, although they had a very good understanding of the law, they were great teachers of the scripture. They, they understood what the Bible said about the holy and profane, the clean and the unclean. But of course, they were found, in, they were found to be engaged in behaviors against, you know, behaviors for which they taught against. They were being hypocritical. They were being hypocritical. You know, Mr. Franks passed along a quote. I don't remember who the quote was from. Uh, concerning leadership within the church. And he said, you know, for, it's important for leaders to know the way, show the way, and go the way. To know the way, show the way, and go the way. So how damaging is it for those who are following when it's found that their leaders may know the way, and they, and they may even be showing the way, they may be teaching the way, but they are not going the way. They're not actually going the way. Hypocrisy causes the name of God to be blasphemed, to be evil spoken of. When our actions, our words, our behaviors are not in alignment, do not, re, or do not prove out what we claim to be, like Mr. Mitchell was talking about in the first message. When we say that we have a set of values, we say that we have a, have a set of standards, it's important, it's important that our actions, our words, our behaviors Reflect that correctly. Hypocrisy causes the name of God to be blasphemed. And I'm sure that, that, that many of us know of folks that were once part of the church organization uh, in times past, but you know, now they cannot stomach being a part of it due to the hypocrisy of men and women. It's an ugly truth. Men will let you down. Men will let you down. Which is why we should always be looking to the true leader of the church, and that is the resurrected Jesus Christ. If the reason that you buy a product or a particular brand is because of the celebrity that endorses it, what will you do when that celebrity falls from grace? If that's why you've bought into, because of a man or a woman who endorses it, what will you do when they fall from grace? I'm sure that many of us remember Mr. Armstrong saying many different times, don't believe me. Believe your Bible. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be looking to me. You look at the Word of God. You look at the author and finisher of our faith, the only man who has never fallen from grace, never behaved in a hypocritical way, it's the king of the kingdom of God. That's where we look. Thankfully, there are many 
many very devoted people in the church who will not let you down. They won't. They will be devoted, dedicated, steadfast. It's unfortunate that there are those who, because of hypocrisy, cause the name of God to be blasphemed. So hypocrisy in the lives of those who claim to represent the kingdom of God results in the name of God being blasphemed. His word, his way of life, to be evil spoken of, despised, abused with humiliating language. I'm sure that we've seen examples of that where, you know, maybe somebody, you know, is wearing the right symbols, maybe even has scriptures tattooed on their body, and yet their words and their behaviors do not reflect the truth. It causes the name of God to be blasphemed. You call that a Christian? That's what a Christian does? That's not the God I want to worship. All right, so what techniques can we use to limit that kind of blasphemy? Well, don't be hypocritical. That'd be one, don't be hypocritical. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 2. We're st- we're, we should be right there, and we'll read verse uh, f- uh, 5 through 11. But in accordance with the hardness and your impertinent, which is unrepentant heart, you treasure up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each according to uh, his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient and do- continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works for what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. There is one standard. There is one measure. And it doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. It doesn't matter what country you were born in. It doesn't matter what time you were born in. There is one standard. There is no partiality with God. We must hold ourselves to that standard. And if we ever get into an attitude of where we think that for some, for some reason that we're in a special class, that it no longer applies to us, well, that's for them, but those of us in the know can do something different. It is hypocritical. And when people see it, it can cause them to blaspheme the name of God. We have to take personal responsibility for our words and actions and behaviors. We've got to go to God in repentance. We have to be self-checking in that sense. It takes effort, like Mr. Mitchell was talking about. It takes effort to achieve it, to strive for it, to take responsibility for our bad behavior, to go to God in repentance, and to move forward with new commitment to live according to his word. Those are some techniques to avoid the pitfalls of hypocrisy and the blasphemy that it can lead to. What destroys the reputation of an organization quicker than hypocrisy? When representatives of an organization or company or church, industry, country that makes claims to a certain standard behave badly, their bad behavior also reflects on others, on others' view of that organization and that church, that industry, that country. We're subject to doing the same thing. We see somebody from another country, uh, you know, another region of the country, you know, acting in a certain way, maybe carrying around a particular symbol that, that you know, uh, brings anger to many. And we, can, we, can re- we project that same feeling to that entire class, that group, that state, that country, that religion, that race. We're subject to making those same kinds of judgment. That can happen to us too. If our way is hypocritical, others can look at the organization, the church, our God, his truth, and blaspheme it, ridicule it, put it down. Speak of it in a humiliating and damaging language. So it's important that we understand the values of God's brand and monitor ourselves, check ourselves to make sure that our words, our behaviors truly support and endorse, endorse the kingdom of God. All right, number two, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6.
All right, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Let as many uh, bondservants as are under the yoke count or consider uh, their own masters worthy of honor, so that the name of God, the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise or view or treat them with contempt. Don't despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because they are, they who are benefited are believers and beloved. And you might want to put a marker there. Let's go over to Titus chapter three, uh, 2, uh, 3, Titus 3. So just a, either a few pages over or a couple of uh, scrolls on your, your pad. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authority to, to obey and be ready for every good work to speak evil of. To speak evil of. That's the exact same word. Blasphemy. To blaspheme no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. To all. Everyone. All-encompassing regardless of their position. We are not at liberty to blaspheme them. And I want to read just the, the last part of uh, Titus 2, verse 5. And we're, going to, we're going to read more of this, but just that last portion of, of verse 5. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. This whole entire section here is speaking to behaviors that affect, that either result in or can limit the blaspheming of God's name. What's the issue here? It is natural for the carnal mind to speak with contempt, to put down, despise, to make of no account those in positions of authority and leadership. All you have to do is go to work, go to the water cooler, go to the coffee shop, go wherever people gather and yak. It is natural for people to speak against their bosses, against leaders of countries, leaders of organizations, leaders of churches. That is the carnal, natural way. And look at verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. We need to be reminded. <laughs> this is Paul writing to, to Titus. He said, remind them. We need to be reminded too. We need to be reminded not to find ourselves blaspheming or putting down with abusive, humiliating language others, anyone, not just believing masters, it says to do it of no one. We need to be reminded of that. It's natural for workers to take advantage of their bosses or companies, not putting forth their best effort, just doing the minimum required to get by, just doing the right things at the right time so the boss sees you. That's natural. If we fall into this pattern of behavior, we may lead others to do the same and may cause them to speak evil of God, of the God we claim to follow. Oh, you're a Christian. Yeah, I've seen you at work. <laughs> I've heard you at work. I've seen your email. I saw what you posted. What causes blasphemy? Speaking evil of anyone can cause others to blaspheme, to speak evil of the Word of God. Using deception to get by with little effort in our work causes others to blaspheme the Word of God. That's what, that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. Being rebellious and disrespectful of those over us can cause the Word of God to be blasphemed. So what can we do? What kind of techniques can we do to limit that kind of blasphemy. Wherever you work, regardless of who you work for, our work 
should be done as if we are working for Jesus the Christ. Simple as that. That's our mental outlook. That's our picture. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse 5 and se- through 7. Bondservants, be obedient to those who, who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. It is a high calling. We have been called to a high standard. And that's the standard we are called to. We are not at liberty to speak in a blasphemous way about our leaders, our bosses, our supervisors, those in authority over us. But we are to work for them as if we are working for God. Now let's look at, uh, let's go back to uh, Titus chapter 2. In verse uh, 1. These are the behaviors that endorse the kingdom of God. But as for you, speak these things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet and chaste, Homemake, uh, homemake, uh, yeah, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. You know, that phrase is not limited to just that verse. It's the whole section here that's speaking to it. Likewise, likewise exhort the younger men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to, uh, to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Those are the behaviors that endorse the kingdom of God. This is just one section. There's many different places that we can go where the Apostle Paul and others list different behaviors that either lead to blaspheming the name of God or can limit, prevent it, not make it legitimate in terms of somebody complaining about our words or our behaviors. We're to consider those in authority as worthy of honor and respect, not talking back. This can be very difficult in our highly politicized world. It is natural to disrespect these people in political offices in offices. That should not be true among us. Here's a technique to practice. Regardless of you, your position on their views, it is Mr. Rick Perry. Whether you want him as your next president or not, it's Mr. Rick Perry. Rick Perry. It's President Obama. When we fall into the pattern of the world where we speak of these kinds of leaders who we may disagree with, may not think that they're living in accordance with God's way, regardless of that, we are not at liberty to speak of them in a disrespectful, demeaning manner. That is not what a representative, an ambassador of the kingdom of God, that is not how they speak. Email content. A big believer in a 24-hour delay on the send button. Do not put anything in an email that you would be embarrassed to stand before your God and say, I wrote that, I sent that, I forwarded that. Simple as that. Our words are important. Like Mr. Mitchell said, 
they reflect what we truly value, what our standards are. And when people see hypocrisy and they see that kind of attitude, it can lead to them blaspheming even our God. We may work in a cubicle, you may work in an office, you might work at a workbench. Whether you're talking about a supervisor or a coworker, your words should be the same words if they were standing right behind you or right outside your door. It's very easy to fall into the trap, fall along the same pattern of other folks, yak, 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 tearing down, diminishing, being disrespectful, easy to fall into that trap. Better to be silent. Start thinking about or uh, talking about somebody, you think, what would happen if they walked around that door? If my heart would sink, my blood would run cold, <laughs> that should tell you something, shouldn't it? Now, that, that does not preclude being honest when asked about your opinion or input. We can respectfully disagree with somebody's management decision without disrespecting the office or speaking about them or to them with the intent to cause injury. That's the difference. I can disagree with your words and your actions because of standards and values that I believe are true. I can do that, but I can do that in a respectful manner, not in a tone, not with language that is abusive and humiliating and trying to put you in your place. Titus 2, verse 9. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, uh, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, not, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. We do these things that they may, or, or, that they may adorn the doctrine of God. Our example matters. Now let's look at uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when, but when the kindness of, of the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration of the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Why do we do these things? That's why. We were in those shoes. We know what it's like to be on that side of that kind of abusive language. But we've been called to represent the kingdom of God, and to be ambassadors of that kingdom, that culture, and our words and behaviors matter. Our endorsement of the kingdom of God is for the purpose of showing others the way, to show them the way. The vast majority are not going to respond today, but in the day of visitation. Later, they will see and they will give God praise. Leading by example, showing them what the values of the culture of the kingdom of God, the family of God is. So the words, the attitudes, and behaviors of our carnal, fleshly-minded world is pervasive. <laughs> it is pervasive. Satan's brand is very effectively represented by the many who endorse his style and culture. It's all around us all the time. But we've been called to boycott his brand. We've been called to boycott his brand, his products, his services. We've been called to receive sponsorship from God and his brand. We claim to represent his brand. So it's important that our words and behaviors truly represent his values and his style. Our words and behaviors, good or bad, good or bad, will reflect, will be associated with the church that we attend and the God that we claim to worship and follow. That's the association we naturally make. 
When somebody says, I represent, and we see what they say and do, it, we reflect it on the, the body that they claim to represent. We are in that, we are in those shoes. So it's important that we are sure that we're demonstrating our fidelity to what his brand stands for. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, verse 1 through 3. Receive one who is weak in the, uh, the faith, but not to dis disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise to make of no account him who does not eat. And let him not, and let, let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his master he stands and falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God. For God is able to make him stand. Now let's uh, drop down to verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ for its reason. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess God. So that each of us shall give account to himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and I'm convicted by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you, no longer walk, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken evil of. Blasphemed. That is the word blasphemed. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken evil of. For the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, so you might want to put a marker there. We're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> Paul's going to be talking about the same general topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful uh, for me, but not all things edify or build up. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatsoever is sold in the meat market, asking no question for conscience sake. Conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, well, this, that was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not of your own, but, the, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I blasphemed? Paul was being blasphemed. What he was being spoken evil of for the food over which I gave thanks. Therefore, whatever you, uh, whether you eat or drink or, whether you, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jew or the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please or have outgoing consideration, all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So what behaviors was Paul talking about here in dressing? We know Paul wasn't talking about just clean and unclean meats. He's talking about meats being sacrificed to idols. We're not going to go into that aspect of that scripture, but it was about meats being sacrificed to either. Pe people, what the problems were, people were arguing over, over what was in reality a non-salvation issue. They were getting into arguments and disputes over things that just weren't that big of a deal, eating meats offered to idols. And being judgmental 
of those who either did or did not eat. They were showing contempt. They were despising, making of no account, putting down each other. They were setting each other up. They were provoking them to humiliate them by causing them to stumble over their position. To put a stumbling block before them. To embarrass them. To humiliate them. Show them where they're wrong. Not motivated by love. Motivated by vanity. They were not... They were not seeking what was in the best interest of the other. So their behavior could not be described as walking in love. He said, you're not walking in love. Because of these bad behaviors, even their good was spoken evil of. The bad behavior polluted all of their behavior. The people will associate the bad behavior with whatever you claim to represent. Their good was spoken evil of. Because of the attitude, what they were displaying otherwise. You may have great understanding of truth and doctrine, prophecy. They might be able to teach you all kinds of things in the Bible. But they treat, treated their brother and sister like trash. How do we avoid that? What's our strategy for eliminating blasphemy? For limiting blasphemy? All things that we do must be motivated by love. Seeking the other's well-being. Esteeming others better than ourselves. Not despising, not showing contempt. Not seeking our own profit, our our own, you know, uh, putting ourselves up as, or showing ourselves to be so smart, so, you know, understanding, so sophisticated. It goes to the very heart of the matter, our motivation. What motivates us in the way, the words that we say and the actions, behaviors. Our motivation, which according, which according to the values, our motivation, you know, needs to be reflective of the values of the kingdom of God. And it must always be love, true outgoing concern for the best interest of others. When you're tearing somebody down, when you're using contemptible speech for the purpose of humiliating them, it is not love. And it is not what a able representative or ambassador for the kingdom of God should be involved in. That is not how they should be described. If there's an activity that you can't participate in in good faith, don't. Don't. You be true to your faith. It's important that we speak the truth in love, not using contemptuous and humiliating words or actions to put someone else down. You can disagree with a person's decisions, their words, their behaviors, but to use harsh, disrespectful, and abusive language to despise, to verbally abuse with the intent to humiliate or to injure another is an unacceptable behavior for the representatives of the kingdom of God. Another technique, do not rush to publicly point out somebody's misunderstanding or error. Paul said there, give no offense either to the Jew or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Is there an error, a sin against God? Go to them in private. Go to them in private. Make reference to Galatians 6.1. You can read that later. It's not that we don't speak out about sin. But if we're speaking out in love, we don't do it in a public format. Blasting somebody, using language with the intent to humiliate on Facebook or any other media is not behavior befitting an ambassador of Jesus Christ. It's interesting to me that in this section of scripture, the case of blasphemy here is within the church. It's within the church. Church members directed at church members. We're not immune to it, immune from it. It's important that we recognize it, recognize what causes it, 
and use techniques to avoid it. Our world is highly politicized, and there is much blasphemy. You know, that scolding and harsh, disrespectful, abusive language, despising and verbally abusing with humiliating language. We <laughs> just turn on the radio, watch the TV. That's the manner and the culture of the kingdom of this world and its leader, Satan. The church, the church is the diplomatic core of the kingdom of God. This is where we learn to be able representatives of the kingdom of God. Within this group, we should be very different very different from the world. The words that we use with each other, the way we behave towards one another, it's very important. Our good works, our righteousness, our understanding of the truth can be washed away by an attitude of superiority, an attitude of contempt for those who may not have the same level of understanding, using abusive language, using contemptuous speech, wagging our head and, and showing our superiority and putting others down because they don't share your position on a topic is setting them up and setting them up for humiliation. We act that way. It can result in the name of God, in the way of God, being blasphemed. People will associate what you claim, what, people will associate what you claim to represent. The church, the creator God, the kingdom of God, with your words and behaviors, good or bad. They will make that connection. Learning to esteem others better than ourselves, learning to check our thoughts, our words and actions, making sure that they are motivated by our desire for what is truly in the best interest of others, not throwing our brothers and sisters under the bus because they don't see things our way, those attitudes will limit your good work from being blasphemed. We've entered into an intense period of national politics. There'll be many speeches, there'll be news stories, there'll be debates with, ver with various parties, you know, zeroing in on that person that's gonna, that they're gonna sponsor for the presidency of the United States. For the most, most part, they're looking for a person who best represents the values and positions of their party. That person will become the primary ambassador of the party and their words and their behaviors, good or bad, will be associated, will be viewed as representing all of those associated with that party. Manufacturers, service providers, they're gonna continue to identify celebrities who they believe will inspire others to purchase their brands. They'll sponsor them so that these celebrities will endorse their products. The reality is that people associate designer names, brand names, service providers with the words and behaviors of those who claim to represent them. So when representatives behave badly, people will begin to speak evil, not only of them, but of what they claim to represent. Sponsors, of course, will try to distance themselves from it. If it gets bad enough, they will pull their sponsorship because of the damage that's being done to their brand. We are called by God in an offer to be a representative of the kingdom of God. When we answer that call through faithful repentance, we receive his sponsorship through the power of the Holy Spirit and we become ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Just like any other representative, just like any other ambassador, our words and behaviors, good or bad, will be associated with his brand. So our bad behavior, our hypocrisy, our disrespecting of authority, our putting down our brothers and sisters, just to name a few, can result in the name of God, the doctrine of God, the word of God, the way of truth being blasphemed. As we study God's word, which teaches us of his manner, his culture, his values, the values of his brand, let's be diligent to monitor, 
to listen to, to think about our words and our behaviors, to not be so quick to hit that send button and forward inappropriate material, or so quick to answer to somebody in some public forum in a way that may be throwing them under the bus with an attitude of trying to put them in their place or humiliate them. We need to be self-correcting. It takes effort to think about, to pay attention, to be self-correcting in repentance. We do these things as we develop to be able ambassadors of the kingdom of God.